interaction. And uh, this is basically for those who do not know. I am not going to speak for those who know. So mostly your, all your questions are welcome. If anywhere I am a bit uh, fuzzy, not clear to you, please stop me and please interrupt. Okay. And please feel free to ask because I am also, uh, I do not know many, many things which I can learn from you. So it is actually a dialogue between us, me and you, as well as our team of NMMA. So basically, I am going to talk on national databases on monuments and antiquities from the perspective of archae archaeological database management. So those who are at the back, please come front. Come in front. There are various back end seats here. So we, I will be talking on three things. First, of course, it's my duty. Those who are having questions about national mission on monuments and antiquities, I'll be dealing with that, how the things are happening there, how can you get involved with that process. And then we will go for a little bit technical nitty gritties. And those who are aware of various database management systems, this one is not for Maybe the, you can uh, enlighten us with your inputs, but uh, basically it is for those who do not know. Anthropology department, of course, many uh, such departments, they are giving emphasis on database management, but that is not so the case in case of history and other disciplines. So I would like to, like you people to see what is there behind our databases and how the databases actually work. That is my second part. And the third part is the built heritage and sites. How we are documenting, what are the problems, and all these things. That would be short. And I am going now next. Can you tell anyone what is this, this first slide? The first slide. Can anyone tell me, please, what is that? What is it about? The first slide, that, that picture, the image. Any idea? It is not proximity, but yes, you can say about proximity also. But this one, this slide, anyone is uh, familiar with the UNESCO website? These are World Heritage Sites, and then green ones, and then you have red ones, and then you have mixed ones and all, and there is a database working at the back. And that database, that, ta that particular table that forms you are saying all the time, that we are filling up the forms and all these things, and those are boring things, those forms are actually behind these things. So that is the metadata oh, about the data and all these things. Now let us move forward. This is a brief about the establishment of National Mission on Monuments and Antiquities. National Mission was established in 2007. It was declared by the Prime Minister of India in 2003. But it took time to materialize and ultimately national mission came up in 2007. And it had a target of documenting, of course these are the objectives, our uh, respected dignitaries on the dais in the na morning session, they have elaborated few things, the, what are the objectives of national mission. Of course, it is, first is creating a uniform database. People are often saying, uh, one person came and he was asking me and he was telling me that in tech in West Bengal, they are creating a database. No, all the museums, they are having accession registers, right? These accession registers are documenting and all the archeological sites during excavation. You have antiquity registers, okay? That is also another database, right? So why do you require 
one uniform database because this first and foremost is not available accessible to all what you are having in one museum in tamluk or what one museum in guwahati or what you are having in one particular excavation report of rakhigari is it available antiquity antiquity register of rakhigari to all of you is it no it is not but if you are having something one uniform from national database it will be available to you to utilize the data the antiquities as well as well as built heritage and sites so that is of course our there that making platform etc acquisition of data promote awareness that is a bit top down approach isn't it a bit top down approach that we are telling you but thing is that you cannot just that's what i was saying that one fine morning you got up and you cannot say that i will start documenting antiquities and sites you require some kind of training and understanding that's what uh, our dg was telling that you if you and our professor sen gupta was also saying that unless and until know the object you cannot actually say that this particular object belongs to this particular period or this this often happens i am telling you sharing with you one mistake often get, uh, we are finding in our templates uh, which are being submitted you will find in the coastal region uh, from the sites of coastal region early historic sites often terracotta uh, bases are coming which looks like uh, stump or something like that and people always say that identify it even experienced scholars they identify it as elephant foot okay that is my very common example i often give but actually it is nothing but base of amphora amphora because in early historic period that was many coastal sites are having close relationship with uh, roman trading network so amphora bases are found from many coastal sites and people knowledgeable people experienced people they have not seen it that's why they often write identify it as elephant foot and i do not actually blame them because if you do not know the connection you and me you can do the same because one th another story is that like that uh when i took over uh, the charges of all the libraries of asi i went to the central library for in one inspection and found that uh, manuscripts are there in tibetan language and They, they, that is covered and i said what is that they said manuscripts and tibetan language something something i said what something something oh rahul rahul i said rahul sankirtan they said yes yes rahul sankirtan brought it some and something like that i said what <coughs> rahul sankirtan brought um, he went to tibet in 1920s in 1926 he brought several kanjur and tanjur those who don't know about kanjur tanjur kanjur is a compilation of buddha sayings which started getting compiled from 7th century ad during the time of strongsen gampo and uh, these kanjurs are tibetan translation of sanskrit works okay no one kanjur is same to the other because the number of books in one kanjur volume may not be similar to other so there are varieties and different different editions of kanjur total 20 some say 12 some say 7 or 8 that is kanjur and there is tanjur is also there often there will be sanskrit uh, commentaries on various other works these are in there in tanjur but those are not buddha sayings so rahul sankirtan well in 1926 brought all these things back many things actually many versions he donated few to uh, bandarkar oriental research institute some to asi and some to kp jaiswal institute but no one knew about these things and it was there lying there for 100 years 
1920 to 2020, we covered already 100 years. And this was rotting there, <laughs> OK. Uh, Mesolithic stone tools. You can run this query, and you can get the answer. So this kind of, you can get that NMMA website at the top there. So this is something else. And I am actually entering into this most boring your database bad part. So this is, I generally use often, this is from chat GPT. How many of you have heard about chat GPT and used it? Nowadays, uh, a very popular game is, is getting popular in Facebook. Everyone is using their face and getting new photographs of their younger ages, isn't it? That is also artificial intelligence run game. How it is done? <coughs> what is there actually? Actually, <coughs> there is a question, this Madhulika Samanta, this lady, she asked a question to chat GPT hmm, that, uh, please tell me, isn't there any GCMS report on Dior Fahrenheit's composition? Dior Fahrenheit is a famous perfume. And GCMS is, anyone? GCMS goes not from the science branch. Gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. So you can identify that what are the components there in uh, particular perfume. Huh, so so Dior Fahrenheit is a very famous perfume. So I asked the question to Chad GPT. Chad GPT gave a totally wrong answer. And then it is saying that as an AI language model, I don't have access to exer external sources such as GCMS reports or proper proprietary databases. So why, he, why Chad GPT couldn't answer it? What is the answer? Why they couldn't do it? not the duty now to any trainer or teacher. Because if you are having 24, 25 rupees in your hand, you can buy one GB of data. You can get access to anything in the world with this one GB, provided that you do not cross that limit. Information, providing information is not our duty. Okay, we can actually give you access to things and you can find the information through various search engines and various, various uh, sophisticated databases. One such is, you use every day, Google. Google, you are using it for your location analysis, your car, your address, you find an word, odd word and all these things and you just going there and these are the basic things of any good sophisticated database that you will have a mechanism to store, retrieve, run queries. You can have concurrency. Google, if you use Google here, suppose I'm using Google here with my mobile phone. Can anyone else use there who are having tea by, at the backside? Can anyone use Google there? Can anyone use? Well, I am, while I am using Google here inside, can you, anyone else use the same software outside? Can, yes, that is concurrency. Using that same database. Using the same database by different, different people. When there is one uniform national database, that is National Mission on Monuments and Antiquities database online, so many people, one from Pandicherry, one from Kagdweep, one from Patra, one from Dinajpur, one from Sikkim, one from Patna, they all can simultaneously use it. They can run query, it is secured, and they can retrieve their information they want. 
Now, there are different types of databases. Okay, people say that there are seven types of databases. Some say there are 12 types, seven types, four types. There. For uh, clarity's sake, I am using only this uh, four, type of, uh, four type of databases because that will be easier for you because I'm not going to going into deeper into database systems. Because what is running at the back, you, if you don't know, if you think that you are just filling up forms, you will not understand that why keeping certain columns or rows blank in your database will actually make the entire database system unstable. That is the possibility. So you should know actually that what are there. So NMME is our relational database. So we will go relational database means, anybody? Anybody used Access, Microsoft Access, MS Access? Not very much used, people use Excel. But access is easily found free of cost. Now, of course, they have put charge on it. But how many of you? Anybody? Nobody? Access is a nice one. You can use that, actually. So NMMA database is a relational database. And we are dealing with various tables. Now, here we are having one table where accession number is there. Name of the antiquity is there, and name of the site is there. OK. So we have created one database. You know for each site, there is one accession number, a different accession number. OK. But out of those different, different accession registered, we created another table where there is this accession number. We have given a new accession number. And name of the antiquity is written, and the site is written. Suppose we are making one particular database about the archaeological sites only, not built heritage, not antiquities, only archaeological sites. So we have given new numbers, accession numbers, to this database. <coughs> now here you have another one. OK. So here, we have not followed that same table. We have fo not followed the same table. What happened? You can see the table. You have accession number. You have weight, the name of the antiquity, blade, weight, seal. You have name of the site. In the next case, huh, there is another. We are. Uh, the name of the site is there. Earlier, do you have Uttiram Pakkam? No, there is no, no, it is another one. So anyway, so these two can be also connected with each other. And I will describe it later, how it can be connected. So that is establishing relationship between different, different tables. And that is called a relational database. Actually, when you are filling up the forms, you filled up one and form of antiquity. Then you have filled for uh, one dagger. Then you have filled up form for. So that is one table. Then uh, again, another table. But when you are putting a query that how many early historic materials are available in Bakura district, you are connecting all these tables, actually. One template table on dagger, another template on uh, a seal, one other template on a coin. These were all found from Bakura district. There are three tables, three temp uh, templates. If anyone, if I am not clear, please stop me. OK. Yeah. Are you clear? If there is any question, Please ask me. Type of object? Uh, this type of, uh, type of object, there are dif different type of ob objects. One is dagger. They are, they are different. Dagger is uh, 
big knife sort of thing. So there are different, different type of object. All of them found from different excavated sites. Okay. It's not that they are found from same site. We are making one database about all excavated sites. These were all excavated sites. So that is the connecting link between the type of object. It is not that, that the same type has been found everywhere. Different, different things have been found. I will come back to it because there are certain components are there. So these are objects all. This table is an object. The query we are running, the how many early historic materials are available in Bakura, that is a query. That is also part of your NMMA database, isn't it? You are putting queries, asking questions. And of course, then there are forms, okay? There are reports, then there are macros, macros and modules. I am not going into de detail, but you know, those who have used Excel, how many of you? How many of you have used Excel? A few? Of course, since so Excel, <coughs> you can create one formula, and that formula can be, that is actually programming, simplified programming language, isn't it? You can apply it to different, different cells also. That is giving capability, functional capability, with the click of a button, it will perform certain work on the basis of your very easy, simplified programming that is that formula. That is macro, that is embed embedded in your Excel database system. Okay, that kind of things can be added. And module is a combination of several macros actually. So those kind of things are important to understand the database management system, what we are dealing with, now we have come only to relational database. We can, we established one thing. Now various ideas and concepts we have thrown to you, and now these are all jumbled up, but one thing is clear. That different, different tables can be connected with each other, and if that can be done in a database system that is called that is called, we have said several concepts now. We have talked about several concepts. But out of this, maybe many things are not clear to you now, but one thing is clear. If two or three or four tables are there and we can establish relationship between all these tables, what kind of database it will be? Relational database, so NMMA is a relational database. So data type and input data format, there can be different, different data type, that's what we are saying. We can actually say that that is site ID, that is a particular type of data. There, in case of site ID, in case of dholavira, you cannot say uh, dagger. Can you say dagger in case of site ID? You cannot say dagger, or you cannot say, uh, in case of type of object, you cannot say sabasti. Can you say sabasti? Different data type. So data type and data input data format, that can be different kind of things, like that can be short text. Short text, those who have worked with access, they know that is that cannot be more than 255 uh, alphabets, more than 255 alphabets, longer than more to, uh, 255 alphabets. Then you have um, integers, long and short integers. Short integer is just 32-bit data. Long integer is 64-bit data. <laughs> These are numbers, numericals. Even those who have worked with GIS, Geographical Information System, are you aware of <coughs> raster data and vector data? Anybody? Raster and vector data. 
raster and vector data, data format. So raster data, let us talk about vector data first. Vector data is not nothing. Suppose one point, you are putting, placing one point in the graph. It is having a value in the y coordinate, value in the x coordinate also. That is your vector data. Suppose your location, you say latitude and longitude, isn't it? Where are you now? If you say, if, you, if I ask, you will give your GPS reading. Latitude and longitude reading, that is also placing you a point in the graph. So that is your vector data, but it can be converted into long integers. All these numbers only. Long integers can be as small as 2 to the power, minus 2 to the power 63, and something, something, and <laughs> that I don't want to go into all these details. People often say, in this history and archaeology, why you are saying all these things? Because I know, want you people to know what is happening at the back of NMMA database. What is happening there? Why so many questions are there? That this one is, I have given all the information, but uh, our template is not working. Why it is not working? Because you have not filled up particular row there. So that is null value, creating null value. You have not put the relevant kind of information there. That actually wanted you to give numerical values. Suppose weight, you have not given weight in numbers. You have written uh, in text 23 kg, okay. But it is that particular, particular record, the particular khana bharti bolte hai Hindi mein. That actually asking you to give answer in uh, numericals. And you have given it in short text or long text text. So that is not ac getting accepted by the database. So that is your question is getting answered. If you know the type of data and input data format. Now we are going to primary key, foreign key and composite key. That's what we were saying that establishing relationship between two or three tables. So all these big, big columns are known as field. What is there in the field that is field data type? It is their attribute also. What kind of data is there? Hmm. Particular field, we are saying that museum or branch, okay? So that is, of course, a short text. Of course, a short text. In there, what we are putting inside, uh, it will be called as record and what we are writing there exactly, that is the value. Value is not necessarily always numerical. And then, of course, uh, we are writing weight, etc., etc. So there are two tables. Two tables, and these two tables are connected. Okay. How, they are, how are they connected? How could I build one table? without omitting all things from one table and or a crucial information from one table and adding something else to another table. That is happening here. Now accession number is there, museum branch is there, name of the artifact is there, weight and grams is there. In the next table, accession number is there. Museum branch is not there. But can you relate these two tables? Can you make relationship on the basis of what? Accession number. So now we have added one more information. What is there? What did we do? What did we add? Site. Name of the site. It is not the museum. So one more column, one more field, one 
kind of new data type also we added that is also short text and that is provenance that is Raza Vishal Kagar, Lalit Giri, etc. But it is not located where, where in the museum. It is not about the museum. The museum data is in another table. So this accession number, the field of accession number is known as the primary key. And in the, that is in the first table. When that accession number field has gone to the other table, I am talking in Hindi because a lot of people are there from Orissa also. So Orissa and Bihar also. So that is foreign key. But there can be one is primary key. That is accession number. Am I clear? If there is any problem, please stop me. Please stop me and ask me if I am fuzzy or hazy somewhere and if you are not understanding. So this is there and I have to run fast. So this is primary key and when this accession number is taken in the second table, this is the foreign key and sometimes two primary keys can be combinedly used for identifying a third table that is composite key. Now, there are other databases, like object-oriented databases, then hierarchical databases, and network databases. Object-oriented da databases are important because often we go for such kind of ideas which are related to object-oriented principles. Concurrency control, we have already discussed. What is concurrency control? We have just discussed concurrency. What is that? Yes? Yes, simultaneously, that you can control. And there are transactions also inside databases. Like I was telling you that we have published 12,61,000 templates of antiquities in NMMA database. So that is one whole database. And then I said we have corrected, made corrections of 30,000, nearly 30,000 templates. We didn't delete it. We kept it on the cloud only, but we have hidden it. So we have now, if you go to the NMMA website, it will show that we have 12,39,000 templates. OK, so what is happening actually? Someone is having uh, 10 apples. Two apples he has hidden in his back. He is showing you eight apples. So something has happened. That is transaction. What is? That is hiding something there, taking away something, giving it to someone. But the total number of apples are remaining the same. That is how many apples? Ten. So that is transaction is happening. The total number of database materials, the data, the data actually that is remaining same, that can happen also in case of bank. You are creating one account, two accounts, something, something like that. So there are hierarchical database like Archaeological Survey of India headquarters. Then how many circles it is having below? Hmm, that is sort of, and then how many sub-circles? That is hierarchical database. Or there are network database. Now, one circle essay is in charge of not only archaeological materials, but he is on charge of, in charge of science branch also. Okay. So that is not only archaeological cadre. He is serving there as the head of the science branch also, science cadre also. That is creating network. That kind of network is present in relational databases also. And these are the four types of databases that we have dealt with. <coughs> Some well known archaeological data. This is one of my favorites. I always give examples of this. This is Amphora database by Southampton University. So, 
Can anyone click to that particular uh, link? If you click to that link, you will go to all kinds of amphora. You click any alphabetically ordered amphora, OK? If you want to get any information, can you click on that link? Hmm. So anyway, I, uh, you can check it. If you have Google with you and your mobile, check, click on that link. You will find what is there actually behind that, behind what you are seeing, graphic user interface. This is your graphic user interface. This is not your database. This is your graphic user interface. At the back side of it, there is data. It is creating query. If you are saying uh, am amphora, amphora africano, huh, particular type, if you click that name, it will give you how many shards are available uh, which have been published in a re peer reviewed journal, what are their characteristics, how they look like, 3D of those particular shards, then there will be measurements, there will be videos. These are actually not these photographs, graphs, etc. These are not particular uh, data. Uh, these are actually OEL, object. No, link, <laughs> click, no. What? Internet, ni oh, achha, sorry, they do not have internet there. This may, OK, no issue, next. No, no, ah. next, 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 yes. Nick, no. Ah, this. So with the help of your database, you can understand patterns also. What is that? This particular thing is this graph. This graph. This graph is? Yes? No, that is line graph. But can you see what is there? Latin America, Europe, Asia, and Pacific. What has been written there? Number of World Heritage properties inscribed each year by region. From your those boring tables, you have just seen one boring table. Not one, two, three, four boring tables you have seen. So from those boring tables, you have run queries. How many? World Heritage Properties were inscribed per region. And your database, after running that query, giving you the answer. And through that, we can understand the patterns of inscri inscription of data, I mean, this World Heritage Properties in each continent. And this one, I got the information from uh, Dr. Charutha Kulkarni, and it's a very interesting, actually. Unfortunately, she, she could not be here, but this is how different type of databases, like in case of object-oriented databases, you use uh, methods and processes also along with your data. That's how it is different from relational database. Like you use queries also. You use uh, different kinds of maps, different ki kind of images. Now this INQUA database is about your uh, Holocene landscape, okay? And different parameters of landscape and all these things, they have been incorporated into a single database, running queries and answering varying various questions about archeological landscape in late Holocene and how anthropogenic activities, human beings change that landscape. These are the questions. It is not there in your data set, in your table. Table to itna simple tha na, ki usme ek column tha, kitna antiquity mila, kitna site kitna bada tha, site kis period ka. Was it there? No. But if you run such queries, it will match 
It will create relationship, establish relationship between various tables, and it will give you the answer. And these are the things what we are doing also in case of built heritage and sites. So what is built heritage? It's a generic term now, site, and how we are connect connecting or collecting data. And what we are collecting basically is these are all unprotected by state government or central government. These are our formats and we, uh, these are our parameters and these are our fields. Form ke hisaab se likha gaya hai. Jara tera kar do. Upar wahi aayega field and niche wahi aayega record or rows. Jo kehte hai na, these are all records. Now, these are 21 parameters and these are important for your documentation. You have to write, otherwise you will miss the context. Not only that, your template will be null. Your database will not be able to recognize that. So authenticity is important, identification is important, and the values, these are important. I am going fast. Please tell me which one to be documented. This one is 100 year old. All of them are 100 year old. This tea shop in Vivadi Bagh, those who are in Kolkata, they know. Vinoy Badal Dinesh Bag, a tea shop, very old one, 100 years old. The house is there that is also 100 years old. We are not talking about antiquities. Which one is to be documented by you? Both. If we had that kind of money, we could have done that. Hmm. But I am giving you an option. You have to choose one from it. Right one and the left one, why not? It is also having some over, a very old one. We are not documenting antiquities. Some over belongs to antiquity part. And this particular shop has been totally modified. Nothing of the ancient period is remaining there. Okay? So a big cross to that first photograph. And the next one, yes, we have to document. But if the question arises like this, which one to be documented here? What is happening here? Right one has already been documented. And right one is very well known also. It is, it is Taprom, Taprom in Cambodia, Taprom Temple. It was having this silk trees and it, was, it has been documented as it is and kept as it is. Because silk tree, keeping that silk tree also tells about its past also there. But unfortunately, this looks far better than Taprom, isn't it? Wonderful conservation, is it? Wonderful conservation, right one? Why not? Yes, completely destroyed its authenticity, the values connected. That's what we were saying, that NARA document of authenticity. Authenticity considered in this way and affirmed in the Charter of Venice appears as the essential qualifying factor concerning values. Unless and until we pay attention to the values connected with our old things, it will become something new, like building one new Taj Mahal. So these are the other parameters which you have to fill up. And these are the things, answer questions that can be answered. I did these things in Mahasana district with the help of GIS. We did contour surveys and all created visibility map out of GIS. And behind that, those horrible forms, horrible tables we were discussing, and you were not understanding what ma'am is saying, all these rubbish things, attributes and all data type, data inputs, concurrency, and all those things. Actually, those inherent qualities inside data that helps you build the data the way you want it to be structured 
you can create and answer such questions that what is the area which can be visible to human eye from a certain point like Vadnagar in Mahasana district. And your, you run that query to your database. If you structured the database in the right manner, you can get such answers. So I am late by 20 minutes as we started a little late also. So these are the benefits you all know. I don't want to go into detail. And this is with this. Thank you very much. And I'm already late. Thank you so much.